that our last keynote speaker uh, had fallen sick. So we were left without the final keynote speaker, but luckily Munich is full of uh, great researchers and luckily we know a few and uh, we could uh, um, we, we could convince uh, Bastian Rieck from the Helmholtz Center in Munich to come and to deliver the final keynote um, of, of our symposium as a replacement. So, so Bastian's background is in mathematics. He's one of the experts in topological data analysis in machine learning. He did his PhD in, in Heidelberg and then um, postdoc, uh, postdoctoral time in Kaiserslautern and later on in ETH Zurich in my lab, in fact. And then he became a PI at the Helmholtz Center here in Munich recently. He's a rising star at this intersection of topological data analysis and machine learning. He's also the program chair of this new Learning on Graphs conference, LOG, that's happening for the first time this year. So um, we now move from the more medical perspective of process medicine, maybe more to, 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 excuse me, to the, from the more medical perspective to the more mathematical perspective on what you can do in the life sciences and in, in, the, in, in, in data science in the life sciences. Thank you very much for coming. On short notice, Bastian, we are really happy to have you here, and we are looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much for, for having me. Is the microphone already live? I have the feeling it's not. Maybe I need to do something. Um, or is it just live? Is it? Is it already live? Ah, yes. Now, I, now this is so much better. Thank you very much for your for your really kind words. Um, it's also a pleasure to be here on on short notice. So I I cobbled this together for a general audience, as I was told. So I try to take everyone with me, and I hope that we can have a nice Q and A session as well. So the title of of this is more like a framework. I would say it's called a good scale is hard to find shape analysis using topology. And first, let's maybe give you a small induction of what I like to do. This is one of my favorite pictures. It's not drawn by myself, it's drawn by an AI. It's supposed to represent this idea of what you can do with topology and how shapes are kind of melting. And maybe it has a certain surreal char characteristic, which is, which is what I'm going for, because in practice, we almost never are dealing with the, with the right shape, but we're dealing with deformations. We're dealing with deformed, perturbed variants of such a shape. Now. Let me talk a little bit about algebraic topology, my uh, special subfield back in the days when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. This is what I studied in mathematics. It's a field that is supposedly about counting and calculating stuff. And when you look up a definition of algebraic topology, you will find a bunch of them, of course. So a very prosaic one is we want to develop invariants that classify topological spaces up to homomorphism. There's a bunch of weird words already in there. We don't have to use them. Another one is we can use tools from algebra to study topological spaces, whatever these topological spaces are. But what I like to think about in the terms of topology is we want to understand shapes through calculations. And I'm stressing the calculations part because we humans have a very good visual system, and probably most of you know this better than, than I do. I mean, mine, as you can see, is also not working properly most of the time. So we're really, really good at recognizing shapes, really, really good at seeing each other. And the question is now, how can we bring this into the computer world? How can we somehow leverage things that our cortex can do uh, on its own? Now, a first taste, and this is probably something that you will encounter lots of times when you look at my stuff or <laughs> things that deal with topology in general, that's the seven bridges of Königsberg problem. The first, I would say, first historical occurrence of topological data analysis, if you want to call it that, it dates back to Euler because of course it does. Everything dates back to Euler if you look uh, long enough in mathematics, either that or Gauss. So um, I think I said this in another talk before, but if you ever do a pub quiz and you're asked about mathematics, then Euler and Gauss are your sure guesses, I would say. Now, in the seven bridges of Königsberg, the question is, can you do a walk through the city that crosses every bridge of Königsberg exactly once? And if you look at the city, there's a map, so there's some geometry there, and it's kind of hard to do that, and you could probably walk through Königsberg all day long. It's a nice city, I've heard, so you could do that. Or you could abstract this, and you could build a graph that has the, the bridges as its nodes, and then it tries to build a connectivity from, from up there. And when you do this, you will find that this is actually one of the first theorems that you often learn in graph theory and undergraduate graph theory. No such walk can actually exist because there are more than two vertices with odd degree. 
And this is so fascinating to me because this is a geometric problem or, a, well, let's maybe not stretch real world problem too much here. But for me, this is a real world problem. And you have abstracted it just by virtue of putting it into a graph and then ascertaining some of the properties of that graph. And that has almost a magical character to it to me. And this is one of the aspects of topology and topological data analysis. That's, of course, not the only thing we can do. So um, I have uh, said this before. We'll stay with Euler for a while because he's, he's the man. So there's also other invariants that we can calculate of spaces. An invariant is something that remains fixed while we transform the space, while we subject it to certain transformations. The transformations can be homeomorphisms, so um, stretching something or bending it without tearing it, or they can be something different. If you are dealing with graph machine learning, for instance, you have probably encountered the term permutation invariant or permutation equivariant uh, um, sometime. And this is exactly one of those invariants that people are now looking for that they're interested in. Because if I give you a graph for a machine learning algorithm, then probably the output should not change if you just change the ordering of the vertices. It should change, however, if you start rewiring the graph. And coming back to this Euler characteristic here, the Euler characteristic is a very simple way of defining a polyhedron, so a shape that we can nicely draw. It's defined as the number of vertices V minus the number of edges E plus the number of faces F respectively. And you can calculate this and there's a nice theorem, of course, attached to this because this is how math works. And you can show that the Euler characteristic of every platonic solid is exactly two. Interestingly, this theorem also characterizes platonic solids. So if you, if you have this theorem, you can characterize the solids or you can do it the other way around because you can show that any one of those shapes um, must by necessity be a platonic solid if it has this Euler characteristic here and satisfies certain other properties. Now, some of you might recognize those. I took them, I think, from a very nice uh, book by Kepler. Um, the symbols there are not meant to to represent anything here. I think this was some, some alchemical part here, uh, which we're not doing here because that's, that's of course not science, but I think it looks nicely drawn. So uh, we can check this, of course. Let's briefly walk through this just so you can see that I'm not lying to you, or at least I'm not lying on purpose to you. I might be lying because I'm just uh, plain wrong in some of the aspects here because that's also something that we have in science, but it's not, uh, it's not a misinformation on purpose here. So for the tetrahedron, we can do four minus six plus four. That's uh, two. We can do the same for hexahedron, for the octahedron, for the dodecahedron, um, and for the icosahedron. And there we have it. And by the way, I think I switched uh, two of these places here. That was just for someone to check. But yeah, I guess uh, I, I guess I could have done it on purpose as well. Now, let's walk um, through some more invariants here and see what we can what we can do in higher dimensions because. Well, I mean, platonic solids are all well and good, but I mean, I don't know about you, but the last time I encountered a platonic solid was when I was playing Dungeons and Dragons about 10 years ago. And so this is not really what we're dealing with in science anymore, but we can go higher, of course. There's another nice invariant that is called the Betti number. It's um, uh, named after Enrico Betti. And the, this D Betti number counts the number of D-dimensional holes in a space, whatever that might be. We'll see some, some examples of this later on. And primarily, it can be used to distinguish between spaces because it is what we uh, call a homeomorphism invariant. So if you bend your space, if you stretch it, if you tear it a little bit, it will not change. So in that sense, it is a characteristic property of a space. The Betty numbers have very nice properties in that they represent I would say intuitively capturable objects or capturable characteristics. For dimension zero, for instance, these are the connected components. For dimension one, these are the cycles in a data set or in a graph. And for dimension two, these are the voids. So for instance, when you think about proteins or molecules or something like this, and you, you thicken them a little bit, then in D equals two, you will find the pockets that they enclose. So I've been told that this is something that people are being interested in. Um, I myself have not been working with such data, so this is just uh, this is just an educated guess on my part. Let's look at some examples here. The ordinary point, so nothing without any extents, has a Betti number of one and zero and zero respectively. So just one connected component, nothing else going on. We can do a little bit more with a cube. A cube, which I assume to be a thing that contains some space, 
has a Betti number of one in dimension two because you, it encloses one void and we can do the same for the sphere and for the torus as well. I'm not gonna go into the details why the torus has exactly two cycles here. That's actually a very interesting and, and deep theorem in topology as well. But if you wanna go for an intuitive explanation, I would say there's one cycle that you can immediately see because it's the one that you can uh, put your finger through. So if you eat a donut like this, you can eat it around your finger. Um, and the other cycle you can do by uh, thinking of hanging it up on a Christmas tree as an ornament. That's the second cycle you can find. Now, at this point, since we're now walking towards computation topology, let me say a few words about why these invariants are useful in general. So not the Betty number specifically, but why it's really useful to have invariants. When you define an invariant, when you look for characteristic properties, you're always in a struggle between having something that is extremely precise, so you want something that tells your data sets apart that has very high expressive power. So for instance, for those of you that are into the graph machine learning domain a little bit, you might have heard about the Weisfeller-Lehmann hierarchy or the Weisfeller-Lehmann graph kernel or the Weisfeller-Lehmann test for subgraph isomorphism. And these are exactly things that you're, that you're looking for. So you want something that is very expressive and that tells your data sets apart. On the other hand, and that's, that's kind of the, this, uh, the balancing part of this coin, you also want something that you can compute effectively and efficiently. It's not useful if you have an invariant that is NP hard to compute so where you don't have an efficient algorithm because then it doesn't scale and you can't use it in practice. And at the risk of, of being proven uh, wrong with uh, YouTube comments or comments from the audience here, I think that computational topology tries to navigate this path a little bit. So we, we try to develop invariants that are sort of expressive while still being sort of computable. Of course, that doesn't work in all dimensions and for all kinds of data sets, but for lower dimensional data sets and lower dimensional topological features, we are doing quite well. And we'll now be looking into what this means in practice, moving to computational topology. And that's a new subfield that has been rising for like about a decade, maybe give or take. And in computational topology, the idea is that you take all the methods, methods from algebraic topology and you make them actually computable, you make them actually implementable on a computer and potentially also in your network. We'll see a bunch of examples of this as well. Now, reality, of course, is always messy. Maybe, maybe often is not, not even appropriate. Maybe it's always messy. Now, what we see typically is we deal with a point cloud like this, like just something that looks a little bit like a torus potentially. What we see as a, as a human or what we try to link this back to, if you're a platonist, then this is this is the thing that you're that you're looking for on the right hand side. You try to link this to a an actual to an idealized torus. And computational topology helps us bridge that gap, going from the left hand side to the right hand side, going from the unstructured discrete point cloud to the nice shape on the right hand side. Now, how does it do that? I of course can't give a, a very nice introduction into the intricate details of the algorithms here. So I'll just opt for a very intuitive and hopefully visually appealing way of doing things. What we're essentially doing with these topological methods and persistent homology is one specific one here. We approximate a point cloud at different scales in the data. So we look at it from near, nearby and from far away, and we observe how topological features appear and disappear as the scale changes. For those of you in the know, or for those of you who want to know more, and be assured there'll also be some references later on, uh, this is known as a Via Torres Rips complex calculation. And interestingly enough, I have to mention this historical tidbit because it's fascinating to me. Uh, this was actually developed in the beginning of the 20th century. So not the 21st, mind you, but the 20th. So I think Leopold Viatoris wrote this seminal paper on calculating these types of complexes from point clouds in 1928. Of course, his terminology was a little bit off. I mean, he wouldn't say point cloud or computer or whatever, but the, the, the principle is the same. He was already thinking by then at... Uh, about how to leverage the power of algebraic topology, which was a very, very young field back then as well, in order to describe discrete data sets, because he had the hunch that this might be something uh, very relevant and very interesting. I think this is also a very nice way of, of showing a conference between statistics and, and data analysis, because I think his main paper was motivated by uh, tabulating certain statistical um, 
uh, calculations and statistical results uh, from a census or something like this. Anyway, this v torus works complex is super easy to calculate. We pick a distance and we pick a, a threshold epsilon, and then we just start connecting subsets if the pairwise distance of their points falls below that threshold. And of course, we do this only for pairs that are non-identical. And now as we grow this threshold, here's a nice animation I've prepared. You can see that more and more things start to be connected. And now suppose that we are looking for cycles in this data set, then at some point going from this scale to this scale, we have finally identified a cycle. This cycle then persists for another scale. This is also where the name persistent homology is coming from because we are tracking how long features survive in this process. And after a certain threshold, it gets closed again, it gets swallowed because we have reached a maximum of our zoom level, so to say. Now, that's the intuition behind that. You can actually use that for all kinds of point clouds. It's not restricted to point clouds. We'll see also some examples of this later on in the talk. But to illustrate this principle once more and what to actually do with these topological features, let me show this to you with a, with a projection of a 2D point cloud. Again, we can start growing our uh, Euclidean spheres around the individual points, and we can track topological features. And in the end, what we do get out of this, and this is, I think, the key takeaway that I want you to have. If you forget everything else from, from my talk, from the keynote, please take away two things, namely that Euler did a lot of stuff in topology and that this descriptor on the right-hand side is called a persistence diagram. The persistence diagram, this little diagram on the right-hand side, captures topological features and it captures their creation and destruction across different scales. So basically, the more activity you have in there, the more topological complexity there is in your object. And you can do all kinds of interesting things with this, of course, and um, I promise that I'll go light on the formulas here, but I just want to, want to show this to you at least once to see why people are doing this, and we'll see more motivations for why this is interesting in machine learning as well. So the first thing that you can do with these persistence diagrams, with these descriptors, is you can calculate a distance between them. In fact, maybe you've heard about the uh, concept optimal transport. This is one of the nicest applications of optimal transport that I'm aware of. So you can take two persistence diagrams, D and D prime, and you can calculate what is known as the bottleneck distance or also the um, some kind of Wasserstein distance between them, which is essentially solving an optimal matching problem. So you try to take all the points in one diagram, you try to match them to the other diagram, and you have an internal cost for doing so. And then you try to solve for the infimum over the supremum of this uh, respective cost function. So this is also where the idea of the bottleneck comes from. You're searching for the best matching that you can find, and then you take the largest distance, the largest cost that you have to entail to make the matching stick. That's known as the bottleneck distance. There's a relaxed variant of this distance around as well, which is known as the Wasserstein distance. Technically, I should say the Wasserstein distance between persistence diagrams, because you can, of course, also calculate the Wasserstein distance between uh, probability distributions. Uh, so these are actually the same it's the same distance in some sense, it's just being calculated over different spaces. Now, why would you want to do this? Well, one nice thing is that persistence diagrams are actually stable under certain transformations of the data. And in particular, one stability that is really great for us when we're doing machine learning later on is that they are stable under certain sampling conditions. So in particular, you have probably heard about the term mini batch or batch in in machine learning, of course. So when you do batches, when you take subsamples of your data and you work with them, then you are almost virtually always guaranteed, and we have actually a theorem that quantifies this a little bit, how the persistent homology, how the topological features of your data set behave under this subsampling. Uh, here, I give you just an intuitive view, so you can three, uh, three point clouds, and you can see that the respective persistence diagrams in, I think that's dimension one, uh, they are more or less of the same shape. I'm saying more or less because you can see that the blue point cloud here, oh no, I'm not going, not going to try this because it's, a, it's an extended screen. Oh no, but it works. The blue point cloud has a little bit of a different sampling here, so I, I changed the sampling conditions here on purpose, but you can see that um, the persistence diagram is still kind of, kind of similar. Now, let's make this more precise. Uh, since we already have a, a distance definition, we can also um, def define this more formally. So if you have a triangular little space, so something that you can add a triangulation to, which in, I would say, our modern parlance is almost any data space that you will ever encounter, and you have a continuous tame function that is a function that has only a finite number of critical points, so it's not something that is really degenerate or, or ill-behaved, uh, then 
the corresponding persistence diagrams satisfy um, a relationship uh, in that their bottleneck distance is bounded by the Hausdorff distance between the functions. And that's also a very surprising result to me, because if you let that sink in for a minute, you have on the right-hand side a Hausdorff distance, which is a fundamentally geometrical property. But on the left-hand side, you have a topological distance. You have a property between topological features. So here, geometry and topology go hand in hand, and one bounds the other, which is a really nice way to, to think about these computation topology methods, because and it's good that, that, this is, that this is live streamed as well. I think the field is, is misnomed. It should also contain some form of geometry in there. So if people hear computation topology, they think, oh, we're doing just discrete stuff and we throw geometry out of the window. But that's actually not true. So as you can see here, geometry is being kept around and is being used. Now, moving onward a little bit, um, this is a slide that I, that I discovered recently when I when I did some historical digging here, because persistent homology is actually an idea that has been around for some time, and it affords a very generic view on your data, which is something that I'll try to convince you in the second part of this keynote lecture when I show some applications. And I'll try to not butcher this quote too much. There's a quote by Victor Hugo, which is, on résiste à l'invasion des armées, on ne résiste pas à l'invasion des idées. So something very freely translated, uh, this means um, you can't resist the power of an idea whose time has come. And this you can see this when you go through the papers that I mentioned here, because there have been some precursors of persistent homology already back in the 90s. They called it a distance for similarity classes of submanifolds of Euclidean space, or they called it the frame Morse complex and its invariants, or a size functions from a categorical viewpoint. All of these things are, if you look at this mathematically, precursors to the things that I showed you before, precursors to this idea of looking at data at various scales and seeing how its uh, properties change. But the uh, fundamental or seminal paper that I was uh, growing up with, so to speak, as a researcher, is called Topological Persistence and Simplification. And let me just give you a quote here so you can see that these notions are um, ap applicable in uh, general settings. In this paper, they, uh, Edelsbrunner and colleagues write, we formalize a notion of topological simplification within the framework of a filtration, which is the history of a growing complex. So already here, you only need like some way to order your data in some sense or fashion, and this can always be done. Um, they then go on to say, we classify topological change that happens during growth as either a feature or noise, depending on its lifetime or persistence within the filtration. We give fast algorithms for computing persistence and experimental evidence for their speed and utility. And this was done in 2002, and I would say it, it sparked this whole field of topological uh, data analysis that we're now starting to reap the fruits within the context of uh, machine learning. Now, uh, this, is the, this is the last slide before the applications, actually. And I was toying with myself, I was, I was arguing with myself whether I should name this slide, why should you care? So I didn't do this. Instead, I asked the question now here as a rhetorical question. This is the slide that tells you why should you care about these topological features. This all looks nice. It can be like a mathematical game. Mathematicians like to play. They like to develop new stuff. That's, that's kind of cool. Okay, fair enough. But why should you care about this in the context of machine learning? Well, there's a bunch of evidence, um, going back to, to work I, I did with, with Karsten and, and, and colleagues, um, and, and even some PhD students that are sitting here. Um, and this, this shows uh, a lot of uh, nice properties. So for instance, in the context of machine learning, you can think of topological features as constituting an additional set of inductive biases. So you already know that, that the recent paradigm shift has started to happen in, in deep learning. So instead of saying, okay, we can learn everything we can from the data, um, people are now also using uh, specific inductive biases for specific tasks. For instance, when you when you want permutation invariance or permutation equivariance, so adjusting the model to respect certain things, certain properties is uh, has become a staple of modern machine learning research. Now, uh, in another fashion, topological features can also be shown to complement existing machine learning algorithms and endow them with an expressivity that cannot be achieved uh, otherwise. So, for instance. The, our recent paper on topological graph neural networks showed that with uh, topological features, we were able to escape the Weisfeller-Lehmann hierarchy. So we are able to be together, we are, we are more expressive than the individual parts. 
And last, but certainly not least, of course, topological features have also some advantageous theoretical properties. So for instance, in our paper on topological autoencoders, the last one on this slide, uh, we were actually looking at the subsampling conditions and we were able to show that provided your subsampling of your data, so your mini batches, provided that they are kind of well behaved, um, not going into the details here, then your topological features and also your reconstruction is also well behaved. So this is essentially why you might want to care and why these why these features are um, are really being useful. Now, uh, let me show you how to use this in the applications. Um, there is a generic topology driven machine learning pipeline, and recently we have we have started to upgrade this pipeline quite considerably. Let me let me show this to you. So ordinarily, people would use a point cloud, they would do persistent homology, then they would get persistence diagrams from out of there, so these topological descriptors, and then they would look at those diagrams and they would say, okay, this diagram tells me something about the data. So they were being used as static features that can be used in an exploratory data analysis context. But recently, at some point, people realized that, hey, wait, we can also use them as input features for machine learning. I mean, that's not surprising to anyone here, I guess, if you have something that you can calculate and you can represent it somehow, then you can also, of course, throw it as additional features in your, um, in your machine learning algorithm. But the really interesting thing is, and this is a really brand new result that started to occur about, I would say, two years ago, and this is, we can actually back propagate information through this whole pipeline. That is specifically, a gradient from the machine learning algorithm, whatever that might be, from a deep network, for instance, uh, exists under certain mild conditions. So for instance, in the topological autoencoder papers, we were able to enumerate this condition as saying that all the distances in your data set have to be uh, well behaved. You're not allowed to have infinite distances and you're also not allowed to have distances that are, that are too close to each other. So what I, what I mean to say here is that like, it is possible to go back and to go this pipeline in the other direction um, as well. And therein, I would say, lies the, the true value of topological machine learning at the moment, because you don't only get static features out there and you can say, oh, I'm looking at my coffee this morning and the coffee grounds, they look a little bit different today, so this means something. But no, no, you can use those features in classification scenarios, for instance, you can use them for reconstruction purposes and for many other tasks as well. Now, let's take a look at one specific application in the life sciences. We used this back in the, back in the days. Um, we used this for characterizing fMRI data sets. Let me give you a brief rundown, and I'm sorry for being a little bit cursory here because I'm not an expert in fMRI, of course, so this is also my understanding of the technology. fMRI, to my understanding, measures some kind of blood oxygen level dependent activation in your brain. So if you think about it, some very, very hard about something and certain brain areas are involved, then I'm being told there's you need more oxygen there in there and you can and this slides up under the under the machine it is a technique that has temporal and spatial components so you do this um, measurements not only for a single time step but you do this for a longer time so people are lying in the mri for i don't know 45 minutes um, or maybe shorter i don't know um, but you can do this for um, for as long as you want and you can measure this signal all the time however since I guess every one of us, and that's actually a very philosophical issue, so maybe we're at the right place here, um, every one of us perceives the world probably differently and has a different way of thinking about things. Hence, in fMRI data analysis, you are plagued by a large degree of intra-subject variability. So even if, if you and I have ostensibly the same hardware, or I guess I should say wetware in this case, because it's a brain, then it will still behave a little bit differently. So of course, we know where the eyes are, and we know how the cortex uh, works, sort of, but still how I perceive a certain stimulus is different from how you perceive it, probably. Moreover, there are also issues with geometrical alignment, and this is already where maybe the, the alarm bell should, should start ringing, and you could say, ah, okay, we take something that is maybe invariant to certain geometrical transformations, and yes, this is what we did, we used uh, topological data analysis to characterize time-varying fMRI data. Specifically, we characterized them using cubicle persistence. That's in Europe's paper from 2020. And cubicle persistence, not to go into the details here, but it illustrates one of the nice points about this whole topological data analysis um, framework, uh, namely that it indeed works for all kinds of data if you're able to rephrase your problem in a specific manner. And in this case, we were able to reframe our problem as saying that, well, fMRI data is dealing with volume data, but volume data is 
something that can be considered a special type of topological complex, in this case, a cubical complex. And so with minor modifications, all of the things that I said before, so this tracking of topological features, cycles, voids, and so on, this works in this setting as well. Uh, this, this technique is, is built on, on previous work by Wagner and colleagues uh, published in 2012 on efficient computation of persistent homology for cubical data. Now, what we did specifically in this project is we looked at this bold activation function, so the blood oxygen level dependent activation function. We considered this to be a time varying function on some manifold. And in um, one of the few cases where this is actually working quite well, we were able to also understand the manifold directly because the manifold was just the volume data that we got. And so we were able to calculate topological features of this manifold measured via um, this function f and obtain stable topological summaries at different resolutions of this function. Now, the main advantage of this is that this was working on the raw data. And I'm putting raw in quotes here because it's not really the raw data. My collaborators did a great job in, in, in cleaning this up for us and aligning this, of course, but it is as raw as you can get without doing auxiliary representation. So for instance, if you're looking at some fMRI publications, you will find that people often use an atlas, so they think about which regions should be present in the data, um, or they use a correlation graph, something like this. We don't need all of these things. In particular, uh, we, don't need a, we don't need to do um, certain modeling choices, but we can use uh, the data as is, as some kind of time-bearing uh, volume. And let me show you the pipeline with the cubic complex being highlighted as the central or pivotal element here. So we start with an fMRI stack on the left-hand side, we obtain an fMRI volume from this by putting all of this together. Um, it's time varying, this I can't show because else this slide would be a little bit, uh, would, would make you a little bit queasy, I guess. Uh, we, we transform all of this as a cubical complex and from this we extract persistence diagrams. So again, these, these nice diagrams that characterize topological features. Now, if you're attentive still at this late hour, uh, you might see that the persistence diagrams that I'm showing you here, they have a third dimension here. Well. Uh, well spotted in this case, the third dimension is time. So we're really lazy here and we're just stacking them on top of each other because we just use the time dimension as an, as an individual uh, axis here. Uh, notice that for those of you that are interested in time series analysis in general, we are, for this approach at least, we're not using any relations between time steps. So rather we are parallelizing everything and we're just treating every time step as an independent instance uh, of uh, of a topological expression. We could do smarter things here. In fact, we're still working on this. You will find some references to this, but this is what we did back then. And the data set that we are looking at comprised um, about 155 participants uh, who were all watching the film Partly Cloudy. So I do want to stress that this was not a distressing study for, for, for anyone because uh, 122 of our participants were children uh, and only 33 of them were adults. Um, so they were just watching the movie, nothing else was done. They didn't have to solve any tasks, but what this, did, what this uh, amounted to, as I'm told, is it's a continuous stimulation of participants. So it's not something that is known as resting state data or resting state fMRI or something like this. But no, no, they had to watch the movie. Of course, we didn't force them to watch the movie, so they could have closed their eyes and dozed off. We didn't actually, we didn't actually enforce anything here, but they all had the same stimulus, which is great because now we can compare their responses to certain things in the movie. And what we did first is we tried to predict uh, their ages. This is, uh, as I'm being told, this is a neuroscience, um, I would say in the parlance of computer science, it's a smoke test. So it's a test for whether the representations that we are extracting are actually any use at all. And it turns out that they have. To do that, to actually work with um, an age prediction task, we had to evaluate the norm over persistence diagram. So that's another neat mathematical property that you can have of these diagrams. Um, it's essentially just the maximum of the points distances to the diagonal that you can have. This norm is also stable. It's highly useful, in particular, when you want to obtain simple descriptions of time-varying data sets, because by calculating the norm, of course, you turn your high-dimensional topological descriptor into a single time series, and then you can evaluate this in other forms of fashion. Now, uh, to, let's, let's feast our eyes briefly on this table here. This is uh, one of the nicest results of the study, I would say. This is the age prediction based on the summary statistics of all the participants. Uh, you can see that high scores are favorable here because it's a correlation coefficient. So ideally, you would want to have some kind of correlation coefficient of about, I guess, 0 0.9. We're, 
of course not not there yet, but still it's it's pretty pretty nice. I think the mean squared error that we that we had was about um, uh, two or um, two point something years, um, which is which is not too shabby. You can see that in particular, if you compare this with shared response models, this SRM based technique, which we only had available for a specific subset of our data set, then we still outperform them considerably. And I'm, I'm mentioning this because it's surprising that a data uh, collection process and a data analysis process like ours, which just looks at raw data without any bells and whistles, and which also doesn't include any prior biological or neuroscientific knowledge, that this still works that well. But that I think shows how expressive the topological representations can be for these tests. Of course, age prediction is not something that you want to do in practice, so you could do some um, a lot more things. One thing that we tried, and this is still ongoing work because that is really, really complex, and there's no pun intended with the complexity analysis here, we tried to do complexity analysis based on the actual brain states that participants went through. It turns out that the data are very noisy, and we had to uh, aggregate these um, these complexities by the cohort, so we had to aggregate by by the years. And what we were looking for is to what extent a younger cohort is exhibiting higher topological, uh, sorry, lower topological complexity than an older uh, cohort. With the idea being that if you're a very young child and you're watching this movie, then you probably don't understand a lot of what is going on. But you see that there's lots of sounds and noise and fury signifying nothing. And if you're an adult, you probably have a, a an emotional context and an, and a, and a, another context that you can that you can re relate this to. Now, again, stressing this, this is ongoing work. For instance, one thing that we're looking at nowadays is we're trying to relate such trajectories also with uh, actual events and an emotional context in the stimulus, but this is of course hard to do. So there's all kinds of interesting annotated data where we are, where people are tracking facial expressions or where they are asking people in this movie scene, which emotion are you predominantly experiencing? Anger, shame, disgust, joy, surprise, um, apathy, whatever. Um, actually, there's more negative there in there than, than positive ones, but that's not my that's not my key. So I'm not responsible for this. But so so this would be one of the steps where we want to take this next, and then we would characterize the actual shape of the of our brain state trajectory as we um, as we watch or as we encounter a stimulus. Now, with this macroscopic uh, uh, considerations of a brain, let me maybe now zoom in uh, quite a lot and talk briefly about the prediction of the shape of cells. So now we have, a, we have a quite different task. So now we're actually having something where we can measure the outcome quite considerably. So this is relatively recent work um, and also still ongoing because it's a complicated problem. We'll see why this is the case. So my collaborators from Helmholtz, they have a lot of nice cell images. And those are, they say it's images of single cells, but in case you're also as confused as I am, this has nothing to do with single cell data analysis or single cell or SCNR seq analysis. This is something completely different. So what they mean is really like they take pictures of individual cells under the microscope. That's great. They use a confocal fluorescence microscope for this. And then they're interested in predicting the 3D shape of a cell from this 2D uh, image. This is also known as a morphological analysis, and it's, it's a crucial way to detect certain pathologies. So one very seminal paper in this in this area is a paper by Ford on red blood cell morphology. And this states that when used properly, RBC, so red blood cell morphology, can be a key tool for laboratory hematology professionals to recommend appropriate clinical and laboratory follow-up and to select the best tests for definitive diagnosis. So in some sense, and it's maybe maybe some of you um, already recognize this, in some sense, this is what a company um, called Theranos tried to do. Um, we're not we're not claiming that we that we can even do do five percent of what they claim to do because it turns out that they were a hoax company so bad for them, potentially good for us but the the goal would really be if this works would really be that we take some blood sample we try to reconstruct this from individual microscopy images and then we know something about uh, the patient's state of health and I'm stressing this because and I hope no one is queasy too queasy in the audience here um, blood is a really nice substance in that it's almost always available in patients. So unless a patient is really, really sick, you can probably spare at least a drop of blood in the hospital. So it's really a substance that you can easily get and you can easily analyze it. So drawing inference, making inferences from uh, small quantities of human blood is a very nice, um, well, technology to, to have in the future. Um, 
spoiler alert, we are not quite there yet, but we're making some, some progress. And I'm going to show you uh, what we were able to achieve with topology. So let's first start without topology. Namely, we take a look at the pipeline that we had be before adding some topological information here. What we do is we start with a 2D input on the left-hand side. We throw a machine learning model on there. That's, by the way, that is uh, dotted because it's, of course, something that you can easily uh, replace if you find something better. We let the model predict a 3D shape. And then we use a geometrical loss term, more about that in a minute, uh, and compare it with the ground truth. And the mathematicians or computer scientists in the audience, they might appreciate this. This is really hard. And it's really hard because it's a complicated inverse problem. So we're going from 2D to 3D. I mean, you already know that if I look at my shadow, then I can reconstruct all kinds of interesting things. So it is also essentially an ill-defined problem with a large number of potential solutions. So we do need a lot of input data to, to make this work semi-reliably. And I can already tell you that there will, of course, be cases, depending on how you look at the cell, where this reconstruction can never work because you're just missing features. But we are content with capturing 80% of the cases maybe quite well, and then raising a flag for the cases that we can't handle well. So that would already be, be a nice result there. Now, what we had here is the, the so-called shaper, the shape reconstructing, uh, reconstructing auto encoder. And this is a very simple machine learning technique that employs a convolutional neural network with some fully connected neural networks. And it, as you can see, it, it, it kind of decreases the picture first and then it blows it up again into volume. So it starts with a uh, 64 by 64 image, and then it gives you out a 64 cubed uh, voxel volume. And what this essentially does under the hood is it is learning a likelihood function. A likelihood function is a function that maps every voxel of this grid here, so every point in R3 to some uh, scalar value. And this scalar value indicates the likelihood of a specific voxel being part of the true Volume. So that is what the what this uh, method does, and how it tries to reconstruct the images. Now, for the normal loss function or for the geometry-based loss function, the shaper method uses uh, a geometry-based loss that consists of two components. One is a dice loss, the other one is a binary cross-entropy loss. And without going into the details here, let me just give you the intuition here. So essentially, it compares the geometry of the resulting volumes on a per voxel basis. So what it does is it's looking for whether the reconstructed volume is well aligned with the ground truth one. But there's one issue at least, namely on their own, these, issue, these losses are not sufficient to capture shape variation because if I modify the shape a little bit, then its topological characteristics of course don't change. So I can rotate my icosahedron or my platonic solid in space all I want. It's still a platonic solid, but of course these losses that are very restricted to the voxels themselves, they will then raise an alarm and will say, no, 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 this, this deviates. So you're learning a very restricted set of shapes or uh, shape features. Um, less so than, than you could do in practice. But now let's add topology uh, to the mix and let's hope that this uh, helps solve some problems. This is what we did in our recent Mikai paper. So essentially, if you, if you recall the previous slide, what we, what we added is these three components below. So we use topological features, calculating them of both the 3D prediction and the 3D ground truth. And then we have a topology-based loss that we can combine with a geometry-based loss above to obtain a joint loss and to kind of balance out the geometry-based reconstruction and the topology-based reconstruction. And to go into some more details about this loss, it's something that you have encountered before in these slides. It's the sum of Wasserstein distances between the persistence diagrams and a term that I haven't introduced before, but that I will just now call here total topological variation. Sometimes it's also known as total persistence. Now, these terms have two different um, components or two different uh, raison d'etre, if I can call it that. The first is you align the ground truth likelihood function and the predicted likelihood function, F prime. So you want your ground truth and your predicted uh, function to be as close as possible in the topological sense, mind you. The second term, so this total variation term or this total topological variation term, 
is only applied, of course, to the predicted likelihood function because we can only change that prediction, right? We cannot change the ground truth data. And it's added there to reduce the geometrical topological variation of the predicted likelihood function. So essentially, and you can, you can try this out. I have a website for this if you want to check it out. Um, this reduces the wriggles in the surface that you get because if you have a nice surface, if you have a nice dodecahedron, one of the issues with... with uh, topological features is that I can add a lot of wiggles around this surface and this won't change the overall topology, but it's something that is really, really undesirable. And so adding this additional persistence term in the uh, shown in blue here uh, gets rid of this. And then, of course, we can combine them. And this is, this is what you're all familiar with and what you all know. And we can choose a lambda parameter to, oh, what was that? I hope. Just a, just a oh, okay, okay, great, great, great. Okay, so nothing, I, I didn't destroy anything. That's, that's good. So uh, and then we obtain a combined loss by um, by adding those together and by by weighting them accordingly. So now two interesting um, uh, things here. So namely, uh, we of course tried out what happens if you only go for the topology-based loss, then everything explodes again because topology on its own is not powerful enough to regularize your shape nicely, but geometry on its own is also not powerful enough. So there you have it. This is really something that needs to be optimized jointly. Um, on the other hand, one interesting tidbit that we found in this paper is that it's actually sufficient. And this is one of the moments where, well, well, in hindsight, you're, all, you're always smarter, right? But in hindsight, it was clear to me why this should be the case. So I found a theorem um, from some topology book that explained this a little bit. But um, it turns out that we don't actually need the sum over these Wasserstein distances, but it's sufficient to do one Wasserstein distance in uh, dimension two specifically because cells have kind of nice features and there's a duality in uh, topological persistence going on that we, that we can exploit for these purposes. I'm showing you the the nice version, though, or the, the, the big beefed up version here, though, because that's what we initially trained with. And then the rest is more like an empirical um, result that might not hold for generic data sets. Now, let us briefly uh, look at the results here. And I, I don't want to delve into the details what these error metrics mean. But essentially, what we found is that just by adding this simple ca um, calculation, this simple loss term here, we are able to reduce errors in all relevant metrics quite substantially, except for, of course, um, the odd one out. There's always one experiment where this doesn't work, um, namely in the surface roughness for the nuclear data set. Um, the results are, are still very, very close. And I think this is more like an initialization question. So if we run this multiple times, it might be that we, that we end up having something, uh, something that is relatively close here. One thing I do want to stress here, though, and this is one of the reasons why I'm excited about this project, is that typically you might run into scalability issues if you have very high dimensional topological features. That's not something that I, that I mentioned um, too often here because it didn't appear in, in these cases. But for, for this type of data set, we are actually, we have almost no performance um, decreases whatsoever because it turns out that the topological features are by themselves expressive enough to be calculated on a very, very simplistic rough version of the data. So we don't have to use the... 64 cubed uh, volume data to calculate this part of the loss term, but we can use a downsampled one, and the downsampling is is uh, almost almost free in terms of uh, in terms of uh, computational performance. That's really nice because it, it really ties this together and also demonstrates that those features bring in complementary um, uh, perspectives. Now, uh, that's all I have for you today. So, I hope I was able to convince you a little bit about the fact that. Topology can provide useful inductive biases for shape reconstruction tasks in particular. Um, I do want to stress that another takeaway, so I already have two, so don't forget about Euler being the man. Then persistence diagrams, those are the topological descriptors. And the third one is that they actually encode geometrical and topological properties of the data. So don't get fooled by our bad advertising. Mathematicians are really bad at advertising and naming things. Karsten knows this from, from our work together. I really am bad at this. Um, and... Uh, so we, we name it computation topology, but it's actually actually more. It's also, it also encodes some geometrical properties. Not all of them, but some. Um, and moreover, and this is the fact that I'm most exciting about, uh, excited about, uh, the integration into standard machine learning methods is now possible. So we have something for autoencoders, we have something for graphs, we have something for shape reconstruction tasks. More is hopefully 
to come, I mean, knock on wood, right? Um, if you want to learn more, there's a recent survey that I, um, that I co-authored with uh, Felix Hensel and Michael Moore, also of, of Carson's lab. Um, now, I think, a, a postdoc in, in Stanford. Uh, it's called a Survey of Topological Machine Learning Methods, and it's, um, it's an open access publication in Frontiers in Artificial Intelligence. And last but not least, this is, um, this is now the advertisement part. I, I hope it's okay. Um, if you're interested in topological machine learning and you want to check this out on your own, um, my, my lab and I, we're, we're trying to make this software work. It's called PyTorch Topological. I know, very creative name. You, you see I'm kind of like true, true to form here. It's, it's not a creative name, but it works. And uh, this gives you the power of topology at your fingertips. And it at least at the moment of me saying this, I mean, depending on how fast the others are with the pull request, um, we can do the fMRI data analysis. We can do the shape reconstruction stuff. What we can't do yet, and maybe someone in the audience wants to do that, is we can't do the, the uh, graph neural networks yet, but that's just a matter of time um, until we have uh, rescued our, our old code and put it into, into a nicer framework. But it can already do quite a, quite a few things, and I'm happy to um, discuss more and, and maybe ask, answer any uh, questions about the software. Now, of course, I'm very happy that, that I could be here and I'm looking forward to some of your questions now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bastian both for jumping in and for, and for this inspiring talk. Thank you very much. Thank so you. are there questions for Bastian? Yeah, Armin. Ah. Um, so at a certain point, I missed the step, I think. So you kind of lost me. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry. Because m maybe you're totally in that field. You started out explaining that you measure the shape of these red blood cells, mm -hmm. and you mentioned that your colleagues have a confocal. And somehow the next slide was how you want to go from a two-dimensional to a three-dimensional reconstruction. But if you have a confocal, you have the three-dimensional. Yes. So yeah. at that point, that, I, I lost the connection. Very, very good point. I'm, I'm sorry. This, this, is, this is also my, my lack of, of biology talking there. So the way I understood their problem is that they say um, these uh, doing 3D reconstructions here fast and doing a lot of those is time-consuming for them and doesn't... Two yes. Real right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they they can do it in three D. I mean, in fact, um, the 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 data that we got here, and and this is actually, I, I want to stress this because this is an actual um, uh, ground truth data that that we got. So I didn't make this up or anything. This is really um, one of the ground truths and one of the predictions that we have from our algorithm. They they are being done by by um, by our collaborators, um, but. They are telling me that this is a is a time consuming process and it doesn't doesn't scale very well. So in the meantime, what they are looking for is something that gives them that gets them eighty percent of the way there and that maybe can tell them, oh, this is a blood cell that looks very very anomalous from the two D slides. I'm sorry, I should make this more clear, but this is a very very good point. Thank you very much. Further questions for Bastia, Giovanni. So thank you. It was incredibly fascinating. I have a curiosity. So uh, you saw you showed quite a few results for images and 3D space. Mm -hmm. Yes. How far can you push dimensionality in this setting? Or to put uh -huh. it another way, how badly is this topo topological setting affected by the curse of dimensionality? Yes. Ah, uh, that's a that's a that's a very good question. So now, okay. I don't I don't want to I don't want to do a politician stance and give you a half answer. So. Um, let me dis let me disentangle this though. So first of all, um, it is not affected as much by the curse of dimensionality as other methods because um, fundamentally it's it's built upon the idea of having good distances in your data. And of course, yeah, Euclidean distance suffers from this, but you can throw your own distance in there. You can even throw learned distances or metrics or Mahalanobis distance or whatever you want in there. So in that sense, this can be mitigated. But where the curse of dimensionality really hits us is when we go back. Let's hope that this works. This is the first time I'm, uh, no, one, the second time actually I'm giving a talk since uh, 2020 in, in real life again. So where this curse of dimension and he really hits us is if you look at this V epsilon expression on the bottom of the slide, you have all these subsets that are within um, epsilon or, or, or less to each other. And if you um, 
if you don't restrict the size of your subset, in the worst case, you get two to the power of the number of your points of your subset. So it is a very, very bad scaling in this sense. And this is where the curse of dimensionality hits us. Um, this again can be mitigated by saying, okay, we're only interested in topological features of a certain dimension. So for instance, we can say that empirically speaking for graphs, it's sufficient to do 0D and 1D features to already get uh, nice performance improvements. For higher dimensions, 2D might still be feasible. I personally haven't encountered a data set where really much more beyond 2D was required. I mean, you can build data sets where you can only characterize your, your, your data by, by having higher order dimensions, but it's, it's rare. And now to give you a very precise answer, so this scalability is, is abysmal. You have to, you have to cheat uh, yourself a little bit around this. It, it is possible, but it's, it's hard to do. Um, but at least if you have a 1,000 dimensional point cloud and you're only interested in a bunch of low dimensional topological features, which can still be very expressive, mind you, then it's still something that can be, that can be applied. I, ho I hope this was good. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Sure, Philippe. Um... Yeah, thanks. A uh, very great talk. Uh, and my question was in terms of application. So you, you mentioned a few of them, but I'm sure there are plenty of others. So uh, what about uh, structural bioinformatics? Uh, so structures of molecules, either small molecules or proteins. And in particular, since you mentioned that you can backpropagate, it sounds like things like, you know, alpha fold, et cetera, which predict a structure using some loss functions potentially could also use some, some of your stuff. Uh, did you uh, look at that? Absolutely. No, no uh, not, not yet, to be honest. So I, I, would, I would very much love to. So in fact, I think that um, our, our success in this topological graph neural networks kind of gave us the motivation to dig a little bit deeper into this realm. Um, there, I, I do think that, that this is one of the application areas where we would require a joint optimization or a kind of a joint view on the data, because I don't think that the topological features on their own are any more powerful than, than what is already out there. But potentially, if we phrase this right, and if we set up the task right, then we could have something that is really complementary, because it can capture things that you cannot capture in, in other ways. So yeah, I would definitely be interested in this. There's also some, um, I only mentioned this briefly, I think, let me go back to this. Yeah, it is actually the right slide. So no, it's actually not. Uh, there is um, work with Leslie, but okay, Leslie is on the slide. That's good. There's other work with Leslie where we were looking at evaluating generative models for, for graphs. And here, I think a topological perspective would also be very much warranted because graphs are already topological objects. So it would be very interesting to kind of characterize the expressivity of a generator of a distribution in terms of its topological properties. So, so, so to say, can we get all the modes that live in this space or are we restricted to a certain class of graphs? But I, I also have to say that this is living a little bit in future worlds uh, for now. So uh, ongoing or rather rather planned as research, but definitely interested in, I think definitely worthwhile. And can I have a second, second question or someone else? Yeah. yeah, so super technical question. Uh, mm -hmm. When you talk of, about the differentiability, of uh, the topological representation with respect to the input data. Uh, can you say a bit more about, so I suspect the function is not differentiable, but maybe everywhere, almost everywhere differentiable. Yes, the yes. question is, you know, yes. so, since so, the points appear, there's area where there is no point and suddenly it moves away from the diagonal. Exactly, so, so one thing that we exploit here, maybe just to go back to this, to this diagram here. So one of the, there, there's multiple ways of, of going around this. Some of my colleagues, uh, for instance, um, uh, um, uh, Elkanan Solomon uh, has, been, has been looking into this, um, and Mathieu Carrier as well. Um, uh, here, for this diagram here, we would exploit the fact that um, every point has at least a very, very small neighborhood around, it, um, around itself that doesn't contain any other points. So there's like no overlapping points in this diagram. If we have this condition, then we can show that, um, that the mapping from the space to the diagram is constant, and then the the the, the, the uh, composition rule of, of gradients tells us that we can that we can ignore this part. There's also more technical results if you use different representations, because a lot of things exist in this space that I haven't uh, told you about, unfortunately, here in this talk. Um, apologies for this. Um, if you use a different representation of your topological features, um, then you can show, for instance, that the mapping is uh, is Lipschitz, and then you can um, allude to the 
um, now, I'm, now I'm blanking on the name of the theorem, but then you can allude to a theorem that tells you that the mapping is um, um, differentiable almost everywhere. Um, and then you need some computational tricks to make this gradient actually unique in, in practice, but it, it can be done. And um, it works even with, even kind of out of the box with PyTorch. It works surprisingly surprisingly well. Even if you kind of ignore some some of the degenerate cases, it, it works surprisingly well. Yeah. Thank you. You're very welcome. So let's thank Bastian again for for this very inspiring keynote. Thank you, Bastian. Thank you.